And sure, do your thing. That's like if Michael McDonald was pretending to do an air saxophone, that's what it would sound like. I think Wait. what you meant, Stephen, was finger guns. Finger gun. Oh, wow. It, I, so when I've got Twitch up, it had this like advertisement going, but then it popped up right when you started doing finger guns, which I, it. I think it was pretty cool that you did that that way. Nonprofits, episode six. We back, baby. We're back. I'm Stephen Campbell. And I'm this Frankie is my French. What's up, girl? Um, yeah, we're, we're excited for today. We've got Common Point Queens in the house um, doing all sorts of stuff for, for Queens. Uh, main, the main focus through all of COVID uh, has been food delivery. And I love it. it's been really cool to watch different nonprofits and different organizations and companies in, in general um, adjust to the stressors that COVID has presented to us. And Common Point Queens is a very good example of that. Very excited to talk to Jared in a second. Um, I feel like they are the best thing to happen to Queens since Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> hey, I, I, they're doing more for Queens than Nas, baby. That's the better, <laughs> that's the better reference. That is the better reference. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, it's so they do a lot. Like the, the food delivery is just kind of what is the main focus right now, just because of all the other stuff that they do that they can't typically do is. Uh, Why don't you rattle it off a little bit what they do, Stephen? I'm sure. 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 All sorts of different community oriented programs. Um, they've got pools. They do youth sports. They do. Uh, there's a senior center, I believe. Oh, that's They're dope. Um, I love that. There's oh, so cute. Oh, I want to squeeze them all and kiss their faces. Are you looking at the website right now? No, I'm just saying just in general, I love all. Oh, <laughs> can I, can I admit something? So, um, common point Queens has like a page where it shows like all their programs. And, uh, earlier today I was flipping through it and was blown away that the infinite amount of things that they do. Um, but I realized that I was just clicking on the arrow again and again and again and, and realizing I, kept reading. I was like oh. how many sports programs do they <laughs> hook? but and, so i i thought it was thousands and thousands um but they do tons uh it and anybody that's it. watching from queens um shout so out to like Tom. if you as a human were a nonprofit, you'd be common point queens because you do a lot of stuff okay yeah yeah, yeah. Right. i well, they're a little bit classier than me. Oh, well, um, no, you're a complete trash. <laughs> do it. <laughs> the, you know what's funny is what I was thinking is um, they do a lot with like youth sports and stuff like that. And then I think about the way I grew up and the sporting programs that I was a part of. And um, a little what bit about Simi, Va Simi Valley, California. So Simi what Valley, sport? California. What's that? Oh, um, I wrestled. I played football, soccer when I was really little. Um, but where I'm from, uh, is, is a wild place where all of the ex LAPD would, would retire and then become cops in Simi Valley. That sounds and, like a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. So just imagine like cops that are already quick on a trigger, but now have bad knees. Right. Love it. <laughs> and so it was, uh, it was where Rodney King's assailants got let go. Um, was yeah, it Simi Valley? It, Simi Valley, California. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 2013, 2014, most drug overdoses per capita of any city in the country. Also where the Ronald Reagan Library is, the war on drugs meets drugs. <laughs> you guys made it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> drugs wins. Um, <laughs> but, but where I'm from is super white trash and a lot of uh, white supremacy going on there. And so Ooh. these people would be the coaches of the teams. And That's so not good. no goods coming of that. Yeah. They were the ones teaching the kids. And so there was constantly police officers at all of our games where a, where a uh, father was being carted away after yelling racial obscenities to the other. And so I say all that to just say that it's good that people with a moral backbone are leading some of these, some of these youth sports and some of these uh, community programs. Um, Frankie, did you, were you involved with any sort of like 
I don't know, like sports growing up or like. Uh, so <laughs> I, my, <laughs> my, you know, my, well, I think I've said this before, you know, just from knowing me personally, but my family was not um, fin- financially astute. Uh, we sure. were quite poor. And so I never got to do anything. Um, I used, but I wanted to be a gymnast really bad. I, well, first I wanted to be a contortionist because you I wanted, could, first you wanted to start with contortionism. Well, I, cause I used to do it just at home. Like I used to take both of my legs and put them over my head and then walk down the stairs on my hands. Okay. Um, that's, that's an exorcism, <laughs> not a contortionism. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and then I just used to do all kinds of, and I would, I would um, lay on my stomach and bring my feet all the way up. And so they would be sitting here. Ugh. Yeah. So I could like bend and twist myself in all kinds of like crazy ways. So I wanted to be a contortionist in like the, the circus or something. Then I realized that's not, you know, I was told, you know, that's not a normal dream for a young black girl. <laughs> and so the next goal was I wanted to be a gymnast. So everything, mind you, self-taught, like all of it self-taught. So I wanted to be a gymnast for a while. So I would do all kinds of flips and hibbity hoos and flibbity flams in my backyard. Oh, yeah. Um, I love a flibbity flam. The flibbity flam is my favorite move. Yeah, yeah. That didn't pan out because you need apparently training to get into the Olympics, whatever. Um, (laughs) And so my next thing, (laughs) and this is not a joke, okay? I wanted to be a fencer like on guard, you know, <laughs> with boards. And so I would practice fencing with zero training, knew nothing, okay? And I would go into our, our unfinished basement. Um, don't you love, I'm like my backyard, my basement. We were poor, but anyway, <laughs> but we were though, we just lived in the suburbs, but I would go in our unfinished basement and I would play fencing with the wooden boards, the plywood that was in the basement. Wait, what do you mean? So you had a sword that you were hitting wooden boards with? Oh, you're adorable. No, I had an old broom handle. That was, <laughs> that was, that was my sword. And then I had like plywood that was intended for whatever architect or construction folks were supposed to finish the basement. That never happened. So I would lean them against the wall and like draw people on them. And then I would fight those boards. <laughs> <laughs> what? This was my childhood, okay? So, and I'll never forget. I, yes, did I get injured fencing? Steven, are you wondering? Yes, I did get injured fencing. Um, my opponent, tricky, tricky devil. Sure. Um, I should have bobbed what about when I weaved. And I went on guard and leaned in and I had socks on and the floor probably was slippery. Either way, I slid like at some weirdly high speed into <laughs> these boards forehead first and I just remember waking up on the floor of the basement and like my family's around me and they're laughing hysterically and I'm in excruciating pain long story short I go in the bathroom and I have like you ever seen like it's basically like a fist size oh yeah goose knot just in my forehead so that's that's my experience with um, sports. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was in high school, when I was a freshman in high school, I did join the body, the weightlifting team. I was the only girl on the weightlifting team. And I, I was able to um, uh, leg press 550 pounds, Damn, which is okay. more than all of the boys. And my legs got like, ma- my legs were massive. I mean, I'm talking about them things was thick, okay? And just like muscly and defined. And I quit because all the boys made fun of me because I was so strong. Looking back, I'm like, oh, there were a bunch of jealous bitches and I should have kept going with it, but whatever. So that's my experience with sports. I like that we're tying it into Common Point Queens that I'm thinking of like how to keep kids in a sporting environment that is healthy <laughs> and, and, and you uh you just just don't pe- people won't be hitting themselves in the face with planks of wood while they try to sword fight them if <laughs> if they were to have healthier outlets for their sporting sporting events that's exactly <laughs> i could have really used a place like common point queen like whoa frankie hold on a minute before you go into that very dangerous basement <laughs> yeah right, right. With, with a wooden broomstick that you can impale yourself on because the end pointed at me 
was jagged and broken. You know, if I fell on it, that Wait, it could have. What was the other side? Were, were was both the rounded of them? side. I said it was a broken broom handle. Yeah, but why wouldn't the jagged side go towards the enemy? I'm sorry. I feel like I didn't explain how dumb I was when I was a kid. <laughs> I felt like I covered that part. I was not a bright <laughs> kid. <laughs> Do you ever think about like how much more you got hurt as a child? Like my knees were constantly scraped up. And now if my knees are all bruised up, then it's a completely different, it's a completely different situation. <laughs> I, I, I was constantly knocked on the head. I had knees, my knees were con- just bloody, just always, always bloody. Um, <laughs> And I feel like I'm just not out, of, out here playing enough. I, I agree. And you know what? I, I, I realized just kind of in this moment, like I used to be bloodied and brute, like all the time. I was yeah. fucking something up all the time, like knocking myself in the head. Uh, I, I cut my thumb with, a, I found a razor blade. Okay. Remember how I said I was dumb as a kid? Sure. I found a razor blade um, for like, probably my mom's boyfriend's razor kit or something, whatever. And so I'm like, ooh, I wonder how much pressure I need to apply to cut myself. And I took the razor blade and it basically went almost all the way through my thumb. <laughs> but I, my family was so abusive. I, I got like cloth and toilet paper and wrapped it around my, I should have 100% gone to an ER, definitely needed a stitch or two but I wrapped cloth around my thumb and just held it tight for hours. Cause every time I'd let it go, of course, of course, yeah. You start gushing blood again. Um, and I still have a scar on my thumb from it. Cause no, I never went to the doctor's up, but I would have gotten in trouble. There was one time where my mom decided that she would take a nap and I was like, bitch, that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I decided to chew. She got me a bunch of bubble gum and I, and I chewed, all of it and then molded a pair of sunglasses with the with the bubble gum and then put put it over my eyes as as a pair of uh sunglasses and so then i had bubble gum in like deep deep in my eyelashes and my eyebrows and like i I tried to pull it off and like you know you gotta if you're gonna make bubblegum sunglasses you gotta make sure that you tear them off slow but I, I i got nervous and i tore it off quick and so then i had bubblegum all in my eyebrows and my eyelashes and i knew my mom would be pissed so i was like how do i fix this scissors <laughs> and then so i took scissors and i tried to cut off all of, all of the, the bubblegum out of my eyelash so i had no eyelashes and just bubblegum chunks all in my eyebrows and then tried to play it off Cause I was a smooth motherfucker. I was like, I was just like, she won't notice. And then the first thing she said was, Hey, where'd your eyelashes go? And I, <laughs> I, I had to explain, I had to come clean. And then my mom wouldn't let me have bubble gum by myself. If so you're that- wondering, yes, you are a dumber kid than I was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just if, like if that's on the table, if we were going to like ch- chitty chat about that, you are a dumb dumb. That's so you're telling me you've never looked at bubble gum and thought, can I make eyeglasses out of those? No, but I did look at bubble gum and say, how long can I chew the same piece of gum? Answer, 15 days. It gets, Ew. Oh, you know what? You know what? Yeah, I stuck it to my bedpost every night before I went to sleep. So what? Everyone how did it not that. liquefy? What kind okay. of gum are you fucking with? I don't even remember. Oh, probably it might've been a Hubba Bubba situation. It could have sure. been a big league chew. That was my jam. Um, I, I like that big league chew. So when I was playing little league baseball, um, I thought that the big chunk of tobacco was the big league, league chew, chew. Of course. big league chew. And so like, I would just take gobs full and I would just shove it deep into my cheek. Of course. And I would uh, play baseball. I literally never got a hit. And when I say I never say got a hit. Steven has diabetes of the gums. Sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just just developing new diseases. I I I literally never got one hit, but I always had a fistful of big league chew in Love my it. mouth. Love I was it. more of a role player. Love it. My uh, I was thinking about like when you were saying you always used to get scraped up. My daughter, her and this is the thing. She's had injuries, but her injuries are so different than mine. It's not because she was trying to walk down the stairs on her hands. It isn't because she was a weirdo idiot 
fencing against a two by four in her basement. She like, so <laughs> she was kind of a tomboy when she was little. Now she's gay. That's the secret. But she was a tomboy when she was little. So all of her little buddies were dudes. And I get a call from her school. We think your daughter broke her arm. You need to come pick her up. Oh, do I? You think? And so I get there and she's just like sitting there like a fucking champ holding her arm. That's like bent completely the wrong way, but whatever. And I'm like, what happened? And she's like, well, everybody was jumping off the top of the jungle gym. So I climbed to the top top and jumped off. And then I landed on my arm (laughs) bet. Like that sounds, that's a legit kid injury. You know, the last time I scraped my name, it was because I was wearing heels. I literally wasn't <laughs> drinking. <laughs> I wasn't playing a sport. I was in LA going out with my sister and her boyfriend at the time and walking up the street. And I just missed a step and felt you can see it on my Instagram. Like if you go way, way back and I had a, a knee boo-boo. Oh, I know it was a boo-boo. And I was like, um, where's the mom that's supposed to just jump out of the shadows and kiss it. My last, my last broken arm. So I played rugby for six years and I, of course you did. And I worked for this company, a Tokyo based tech company. And so I, rugby has this culture of, of never being hurt, even though you're very hurt. Right. And so, (laughs) um, I broke my arm. The game was on a Saturday and I played the whole game with the broken arm. And then afterwards we got really, really drunk. That's what you do. And we were playing, uh, you throw lawn darts through a campfire and, and everybody's sitting in a circle around the campfire and you have a beer can at your foot. And so if the lawn dart pierces above the, the middle line, then you have to drink to that middle line. If it pierces okay. below, then you have to shotgun the beer. Okay. And so I was playing where I was throwing it like this, like I would have to just guide with my left hand to do it. And so like- You broke it all the whole time broken arm the whole time. People were getting lawn darts like lodged in their shins and stuff like that. And so I, I say all that to say- These that were all white people also. Yeah, of course they were white people. Okay, that may, they're, just, they're, I, I need to point it out for our viewers. I need yeah. to paint a picture. Just okay, so they have a picture. Yes, it's a bunch of whites around, that, around a fire throwing darts at one another. Um, if you leave us by ourselves for long enough, we'll, we'll kill ourselves off real quick. Um, <laughs> and so, so then the next morning, early in the morning, I had to leave to go to this trade show where it was just me and all the Japanese. And so my lip is busted all the way open like this. My arm, I can't wear a long sleeve because my arm has swelled up so much that it's Oh my like, God, Steven. And so it's like yellow and purple and all this stuff. And uh, that was when the Japanese told me I was not allowed to play rugby anymore that they said that either you need to go professional with rugby or you need to be a fucking professional. Like, and- I love that your boss is just like, yeah, dog. So um, that's cool. The extracurriculars cut that shit out or, you know what I mean? Like that's hilarious. <laughs> also kudos to you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that is toxic masculinity. Um, if you hurt yourself, please get medical attention. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Uh, One of the things I'm so impressed with Common um, Common Point is their ability to feed the people. I think that's so important. Um, and then I, I I turn that inward and look at myself. And you may, I don't know if you know this, Stephen, do you know I have like a, a water and food phobia? <laughs> you have a food and water phobia? You don't know about <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I'm very, very scared of air. So yeah, I get that. <laughs> Okay, now I feel like you're phobia shaming me, but this is a real thing that I struggle. Okay, maybe it's not a struggle, all right? But this is my very Caucasian phobia that I have. It's a real thing. Like if I have food, I can really almost only, like I have to see you make it. Like like when you cook for us, I saw you make it. When we went to eat, I saw them make it. But like if I don't see you make it, or like for example, water. I can have a water bottle in my house just me and my husband and my and our kid and i can leave my water bottle in the kitchen right and i could go to the restroom let's just say come back i can no longer drink that water so you can't get like food delivery at all um it, that's very difficult pizza it's pr- pretty much pizza basically <laughs> it's pizza Damn. Or i have to go to like if i go to a high end spot then i just trust that they're doing in the kitchen exactly what i've seen on chopped 
And then I'm like, oh, okay, sure. this is probably, this is, probably, or like Iron Chef. I'm like, they're probably just back there, Iron Chefing it, and it's fine. But like, yeah, uh, yeah, it's very weird. I can't do it. I so can't. you're like, you're like the little girl from Signs. Okay, yeah, I'm exactly like the little girl from Signs. Whatever. <laughs> and she's adorable and saved the day. She so saved all- the day. I was trying to give you a compliment with your water phobia. But it's it's really bad. Like my husband gets so Charles gets so upset because I literally right now, if I took you back to my bedroom on my bed, th- this is how crazy I am. And I know that it's insane, but it's a real thing. I can't, I've tried to not be wasteful. Like, okay, I'm going to drink this water. Charles will just drink my old water so that we're not super wasteful. But <laughs> on my <laughs> night table right now, I have four bottles of water all at different levels and I cannot go back and drink them. I That's can't. cool. You could you could do a lot of like musical stuff with those glasses. Oh yeah, like yeah. Or maybe I should go boo do 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 because maybe aliens are coming. Yeah. Um, we bring our guest on. I think we should bring our guest on. Um, so our guest coming. We've been talking about him. Give him a good uh, intro, Stephen. Okay, this is a lot of pressure. Um, Again, we've been talking about Common Point Queens. They're doing a lot of work. You're about to hear a lot more of it. Uh, Jared is a guy that I met, I guess it was three months. It was right at the beginning of football season because we were talking about how horrible the Jets were going to do. Um, but that's, he's the opposite of the Jets. That's how great of a guy he is. The, the man who's done more for Queens than Nas. Give it up for Jared Mintz, everybody. No, oh, sleep, sleep no right. Queens. That's not the song. No, not the song. no, sleep, I see, sleep till Queens. I see you, Frankie, trying to get Brooklyn in here when we're trying to highlight Queens. I, yeah, I can understand right. that. That's cool. I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, but I was, I, re- I replaced Brooklyn with Queens. Yeah, it was cool. I it's not the it. right amount of syllables, but it does, <laughs> it does work. It was um, so, Jared, right off the top, give us a quick little uh, what. Does Common Queens do the elevator pitch? And then what is Common Queens, Common Point Queens been doing the 2020 version and all of the, uh, you're adapting to the chaos that 2020 has presented to us? Sure. First, I just want to thank you both for allowing us, you know, this platform for highlighting the work that we do, for allowing me to talk a little bit about the work that we do. You know, Stephen, to the point you made before, about youth sports and seeing a thousand pages on our website, that that's actually true. We do have about a thousand youth sports programs. None <laughs> of them quite, no, I'm just kidding a little bit. None of them quite like the programs you you both grew up playing, but um, <laughs> we have a lot of programs. So when, when you ask me to do an elevator pitch, I like to pretend we're looking at, you know, a 200 floor elevator, because it's, it's a lot of stuff that we do. Um, but to boil it down, we're a Jewish community center in Queens. We're actually two Jewish community centers that merged together in 2018. Uh, the Central Queens Y from Forest Hills and the Samuel Field Y from Little Neck. Both organizations have decades of experience doing early childhood programming, after school, summer camp, senior centers to, you know, the programs you mentioned before. Um, and then over the last 10 years or so, we've really expanded our work to be in high schools in Queens. Uh, we're in pr- public schools in Queens also. We have after school programs at about 26 different schools. Uh, We're a big summer youth employment program provider where we provide internships, uh, job training, employment opportunities to young people ages 16 to 24 in all of New York City, not just Queens. Uh, Workforce programs. We just opened up a brand new workforce hub in Elmhurst um, with the help of UJ Federation of New York, where we're doing job training, job placement, skill development, uh, where people can get jobs in home health aid, IT, uh, culinary fields, trying to provide wow. meaningful uh, employment opportunities for folks. We have a mental health clinic. Um, we really do everything you could think of, something for everybody, all ages and abilities. We have a big pro- program for people with developmental disabilities, mainly youth, adults also. Um, really, we just we look at the needs that our community has and we adapt to provide something for everybody. I love that. Um, you so have that- a real holistic approach. You, you try to provide something for every aspect of the humans that may need help. I love that. Pretty much Absolutely. if you need if you need help, just go to Common Point Queens. And and so what does that look like from like an organizational structure? Is that are just tons and tons of different departments or is it a lot of people wearing a lot of hats? 
Sure, that's a great question. It's definitely a little bit of both. Um, for my role, I'm the director of communications. So I'm really doing marketing and public relations and you know everything digital to try to raise the platform, raise awareness to all of the programs that we just mentioned. But we have a very large program department that's broken into divisions. Uh, we have youth education services, which really encompasses infants and toddlers, nursery school, after school, uh, and then into uh, programs for children with special needs. Um, then we go into our high school and college success, which again is the programs we have in the high schools and the youth employment programs I was just mentioning. We have a workforce department that covers the hub that I was talking about just now uh, with the programs coming out of Elmhurst. Uh, older adults program department, uh, it's a lot. And then we have the programs you were mentioning before, a health and wellness department, which really covers these youth, wonderful youth sports programs, our indoor pool. We're one of the few community centers in Queens that has an indoor pool. And we also have these private pool clubs uh, that you were mentioning before in Bayside and Little Neck. Uh, and we also have a lot of summer camp programs, a lot of really wonderful summer camp programs, which was how I was introduced to the organization. Okay. Mm -hmm. You, you, you truly are, sorry, I was, was going to say you truly are the opposite of the Jets. Uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> damn, you guys are doing so much, man. And, That's crazy. and, and what is 20? So I know you and I have talked a little bit about this, Jerry, but what is 2020 been looking like for you guys? Where has the main focus been? Um, and, and how are things going? We haven't really spoken in a couple months. Sure. Um, look, it's it's tough out here. You know, we're seeing our numbers grow in a lot of our crisis programs. So I mentioned the, the workforce department that we have. Stephen, you know, the, the big reason you brought me on here and that we've connected is the work we've done with food and food distribution and food mm -hmm. delivery. <clears throat> Excuse me. We, in March, we had a single food pantry in Forest Hills um, that, you know, was servicing a lot of clients. We had a couple hundred clients in our database we are in dozens of thousands of clients right now in our food pantry database. We have expanded to now have four food pantries. We just opened oh, up wow. a new food pantry last week at Martin Van Buren High School in Queens Village. We opened a second food pantry in Little Neck. Our original one is in Forest Hills. And uh, the third food pantry that we opened up is at that workforce hub in Elmhurst. So just seeing the need for food increase has really taken precedent for a lot of the work that we did, especially in March. You know, I talked about a lot of the programs we had, and it's really my job to, to sell a lot of the programs we have by means of nursery school, summer camp. We want to engage families to be with us at a young age and then stay with us to kind of become the next level counselors and help us, allow us to help them find jobs to our workforce department. So we're really always looking to, to provide a welcome environment for families to join us. And when March hit and we weren't able to be in person, it really stopped a lot of the programs that we do in person. Um, so a lot of our program staff really turned their attention to, okay, what's the greatest need for our community? And seeing how many seniors that we had that were stuck at home, afraid to leave the house, weren't able to get food delivery to them, you know, did, didn't want to go out for one, and then weren't able to get the services that they were counting on before to bring them food. Um, we had a lot of staff delivering food. We went from serving 500 meals a week to our seniors to delivering 15,000 meals Jesus, a week. Jesus, are you serious? our seniors. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> look, it, it's tough. Um, and it, it's tough to sit here and talk about our agency being successful and meeting the needs of our community because these needs are, it's, it's painful to see the need. Yeah. Um, and I think that's something as a country we're really all experiencing together is, is seeing the dire need and the struggles that people have. You know, it, it's really, it's good timing that we're able to open this workforce hub this fall, just seeing the unemployment rates skyrocketing the way they are. So being able to meet those needs at, at a higher rate than we were before, again, it, it's tough. And, you know, we, we hate to see so many people struggling, but we have the means and the professional team to really provide that help. We were getting a lot of folks enrolled in unemployment benefits. We were working with UJ Federation of New York to provide emergency cash assistance for all kinds of needs, bills that were in arrears, paying for funerals, um, really just providing emergency cash to folks who were out of work, were didn't have money saved up, and were in a really tough place and needed an organization to be able to help them. Um, I would be remiss to not shout out Met Council right now also while talking about the food pantries. 
Med Council has been a big food provider for us and a great partner over the last few years. So there's a lot of people doing really important work and it's nice to know that we're able to help people who are in need as, as much as it hurts to see how great of a need there is. So, you know, you go back to March and you look at, we're not able to do things in person. How do we meet folks in the virtual world? Mm -hmm. uh, the New York City schools took a week to get their stuff figured out. We were making on-demand videos that we could send bedtime stories to our early childhood families that first <laughs> night that school closed. We had filmed yoga classes yeah. that we could get out for our seniors to make sure that they were exercising. We had our counselors for children with developmental disabilities filming their electives, like how to cook spaghetti and meatballs, how to do your laundry. We were just thinking ahead to, we know we're not gonna be able to be in person. How can we continue to provide that personal touch that people come to depend on us for? We really are a home away from home for all of these different ages and demographics. And the challenge was just, how do we not lose that connection with people right now, while also looking ahead to where the greatest needs are? Um, you know, I, I think I briefly mentioned we have a mental health clinic, the need mm -hmm. for people of all ages, the mental health clinics really focused on older adults, but we have people of all ages calling our older adult mental health clinic sure. in need. And, you know, we don't turn <laughs> people down. We're, we're here for the community. So, you know, fortunately, a lot of the stuff that we do, we were able to do virtually. We started offering like 30 exercise classes a week online where we weren't doing any of that before. We had people coming out of the woodwork to do like Instagram live yoga who were volunteering for us. It, it took a village and our slogan is community happens here. And really this year we learned wherever here is that that's where we're going to be doing the work that we do. Yeah, that's dope. Do you guys think you'll keep some of the initiatives you've uh, put forth during this pandemic kind of moving forward? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, Virtual is here to stay. You know, I know yeah, we saw it sure. a couple of weeks ago with the snowstorm, how quickly the city called the day of school. We're in a place where we can do that. Our teachers all have computers. It's not fair to assume that our families all have computers because they don't. You know, that was another big thing that we were doing in March and April was finding out our high school students who didn't have internet connection or didn't have a tablet and getting donated goods that we could get to them so that we could connect with them. So wow. again, we're, we're always going to be looking at how we can meet people in the middle. But to this day, we're still doing the virtual exercise classes. We still have nursery classes that are solely online. We have to be ready and adaptable and we have to be able to pivot whenever we need to. Um, so yeah, a lot of the services in terms of virtual are here to stay. And in terms of food delivery, absolutely. That, that's not going anywhere. Can I, can I ask? I don't want to so, say how long. So one of the things that <clears throat> outside of the tragedy that you guys needed to act the way that you did, one of the things that is very fascinating to me is organizational structures and stuff like that. And very often you see nonprofits, especially one that is to your, like your size, they're very slow moving. There are mm -hmm. boards that need to be briefed on everything. And there are so many people that have to check off to make certain things happen to do something it, you know, even, even though it, it, it's seemingly a, a, a simple thing to, to make a bedtime story type thing, but to be able to make decisions that rapidly, yeah. what, what does that flow of information look like? You know what I mean? Like, was, can I piggyback on your question? Cause that yeah. was what I want. I wanted to know that. And in, in addition, have you mapped this out in a way for it to be scalable to other organizations? That's a, that's a really great question. So I'll speak to, you know, the work that I see our executive team putting in and that they're always on calls. We, I mentioned UJ Federation of New York, shout out to them. Um, they are, we're partners of theirs and they have a very large network with other similar community centers that our executive team is constantly on calls talking about how can we work together, taking ideas from each other. We also work with a uh, JCC Association of North America, which is at least 150 other community centers across the continent, where we're constantly piggybacking ideas off each other, um, crowdsourcing, seeing what the best way to go about providing these services is, and the best way to go about getting funding, best people to partner with. Um, Hebrew Free Loan Society, shout out to them also. They've been a great partner of ours, helping provide loans for small businesses. Um, so yeah, I mean, we... To Stephen, to answer your question, it was meetings daily, hourly meetings daily. That Sunday that Mayor de Blasio said schools are going to be closed through April, um, we, were, we were on the phone all day and we had been meeting the week prior just to make sure everybody was ready. 
And, you know, kind of to draw back to the snow day analogy, it's almost like preparing for a snow day where you're looking at, okay, if we can't be in the building, how are we going to communicate to everybody what we are going to do? And even if it's a message as simple as we're closed, For community centers, it's not like we have these crazy big teams and tech teams and support that are ready to to get information out immediately. Like we are really putting the pieces together, figuring out a lot as we go. Um, But we, you know, we anticipated that at some point the pandemic was going to force us to be at home. So, you know, we really had been meeting and discussing for weeks what ducks we needed to get in a row, how we could best be situated to continue to provide services for clients And really, a lot of it was figuring it out on the fly. Like, we did not anticipate the need for food that that wound up happening. We didn't anticipate Mm -hmm. we were going to be doing meal delivery. It probably took us about a week or so after our older adult um, staff were on the phone with their clients realizing, oh, wow, there's a great need. Like, not only are these folks isolated and at home, they're afraid to go out and get food. You know, things escalated quickly. I, I think as much as we all knew something was coming... We didn't realize what was coming and we didn't realize how long it was going to be the way it was. Mm -hmm. So to that point, I mean, I think it's just really being adaptable and looking at what we're doing and trying to figure out what we're doing wrong. Like over the summer, you know, we wanted to start engaging with families again. We opened up five summer camps that we had to limit capacity so everybody could be socially distanced. This was before anybody was back in school. We didn't quite have regulations on every child needs to wear a mask the way they do in school. Um, and I, I, we didn't have positive COVID cases. Like we kept everybody safe. We kept our staff safe. We kept our family safe. And while everybody is craving that slice of normalcy, that return to normalcy, you know, for us, it's just how do we do this in the safest way possible mm-hmm. where we can engage our people, where we can give them that community feel. Um, and a lot of it's really, you know, we can plan as much as we want. There's constantly wrenches being thrown at us. Sure. So yeah. it's just having to be nimble, being able to pivot, and then having that network of people that we can really bounce ideas off of, see what's working, and and be in it together. So it's been a lot of really great community partners helping us get through this. Yeah. It's been uh, one of the cool things about doing this <clears throat> this podcast is and, and working with Comedy Hub as well is just um, working with people and talking with people that were adapting and rolling with the punches. Um, there's a very big nonprofit that I won't put on blast, but, um, they are a fundraising powerhouse and a lot of runs, walks and stuff like that. A lot of in-person stuff, but they're a foundation that's been around for, or an organization that's been around for so long that when this happened, like they're having mass layoffs right now because they just weren't able to you know, they weren't able to do their galas. They weren't able to do their runs and stuff like that. And so a lot of groups, unfortunately, are not Struggling. as quick to adapt. Um, I think a lot of people fall. I know I fell in that category 100%. I was, you know, I, I was in my, you know, entitled American mind thinking, well, it's not like we're going to be in a pandemic in the sense of being locked in our homes for any extended period of time. I'll, I'll go home. I'll quarantine with my husband because I was living in LA when it ha- when we got put on lockdown. And I was like, I'll go home. I hang out with my hubs and the daughter for two weeks, chill, you know, reconnect with the fam, <laughs> back out to LA, live my superstar lifestyle. <laughs> we lost everything. <laughs> you know I mean? But seriously, you know, we, we're in an apartment now, which I actually love our new apartment. But you know, life is what my life looked like looked like then comparatively speaking to now i did not have like i'm so impressed with your organization jared like so crazy impressed look it's not it's not all roses i mean we you know unfortunately we had some layoffs too i i think our leadership team did everything they could to make that as minimal as possible but you know to your point we're seeing we're seeing it felt at a lot of organizations a lot of businesses big businesses small businesses i mean we applied for loans after loans. We tried to do everything we can to, to stay afloat. And, you know, look, when you're not able to do things in person and so much of our money comes from the summer camps that we offer and the pool clubs and, you know, these programs that we really depend on being able to, to fill and we're not able to fill them, you know, it's, it's tough. We, we definitely felt that impact too. We're still feeling that impact, um, you know, but really it's, at the end of the day, it's, and not to be cliched, and I already started with the cliche by saying at the end of the day, 
But at the end of the day, it's it's really it's about the community need and figuring out how we can adapt to meet those needs. And if it wasn't, you know, your 800 kids in summer camp that we're used to, and it was, you know, a fraction of that, it was making the the meal delivery numbers go up and the mental health services provided go up and doing everything we could to, again, be able to offer the programs that we offered um, just at, at a different level. And I, I'm really proud of the work that our staff does to, to be able to maintain that level of connection because people had fatigue from Zoom and being in front of a computer. Oh, so yeah. we were still able to get 7,000 high school students to log on with us daily when we're not the school, we're the after school. So we're school part two. So like, if you sit in school all day, do you really want to sit in school again? Yeah, yeah, Especially when you're at home right. and on your computer. Right. But like the, the services that we were provided and the value of the services that we provide and the connections that we make, the fact that we were able to just remain, you know, intact with people and continue Honestly, to be there for them. The fact that you, I had mandatory school and I only went 50% of the time when I was in high school. Like the fact that you got people like tuning in, I mean, it means that they want to be there. And so that's always Even very impressive. Control out, delete. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I did not get that email. Frankie, Jerry, can you talk? Oh, sorry, is, what? Is Bootsy doing a lot of online schooling? What does that look like? Yeah, she's uh, so Bootsy's my daughter. She's 15. She's in 10th grade. She's amazing. Not because she's my kid, but probably because she's my kid. But um, she's fully online. She's been online since March. Um, and she's actually done better doing online school than she had a lot of social, she has a lot of social anxiety. Um, you know, she's kind of grown up mostly like she has siblings they're my stepkids and they're all older. Um, you know, my husband's older. So she is used to being around like older people, if that makes sense. So mm. she had a hard time kind of going to school and like interacting with <laughs> Her peers, because you've, you've met her, Stephen. She talks a little different. She's just a little different of a human. But so now kind of that taken out of the equation, she still commiserates with her friends through FaceTime all the time. They're very loud. They play the games together. Um, she has study groups. So she, you know, she's really assimilated very well to online school. It's been great for her. I just think of all the times where my dad would tell me to go play outside and then lock the door. And Shut up. That's not oh, a real yeah. thing that happened to you. Oh yeah. I mean, oh I was unbearable, it, but I, I, my, my I dad, that, though. I can see that. My dad would just Saturday morning would wake me up at seven 30 <laughs> so that he could put me outside, then go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I That's just can't hilarious. even imagine what, what this relation, like what this relationship with the world would look like internally with my family oh um, my god i've envisioned that so the only thing to do in my house was get abused so the thought yeah. of being trapped there in a pandemic with people losing their jobs oh, yeah no thank you i'm good on that no thanks jared what is the uh what is the personal life looking like i know that we've talked a lot about work or have you Tell us about yourself. Yeah, tell us about yourself. <laughs> what it, you got any any New Year's resolutions coming up or anything like that? Just to be patient, just to take things one day at a time. Um, here I go again, clicheing it. Um, no, I mean I try to always be present, be in the moment. The work that we do really kind of puts that front and center for me. Um, you know, even talking to you all about like yeah, we, we've been able to serve so many people. It's a successful year that we're able to help. Like, it's hard to sit here and call any of it successful just sure. because, you know, of how tough it is to see so much of this. But it's really looking on the bright side. It's really trying to make the most of everything. Um, you know, I remember just back in March and April, it, it was tough. It was tough being stuck, not even in the house. Like, it's whatever. I'll go outside. I'll take a walk. I can get my escape. But just knowing, you know, this is kind of what we're living in and, and what we have to really help people with. But like, once you start to see how appreciative people are, you know, I would talk about the, the senior exercise classes that we did. And the first month was really like, how do we get people to figure out how to use technology? It wasn't even like, sure. how do we get people to feel comfortable working out at home? So we almost mm -hmm. turned into like tech support to teach folks and where you would expect them pre pandemic to be frustrated because they don't have patience with you to begin with. They're just so appreciative of you going that extra yeah. mile. And the yeah. same thing, Frankie, you were talking about this with like food delivery where you're like, I don't trust people ringing my doorbell. Somebody's knocking on my door. I'm not going to see who it is. They can leave. 
you know, having people be so appreciative to have people drop food and yeah. like, it's a different world that we're living in. So really not just me counting my blessings, but being appreciative of, you know, kind of just trying to make more personal connections with people and approach with good faith. I think that that's really kind yeah. of the world that we need to live in. And I know it's a, it's a tough climate out there, you know, with everything else going on in our world besides a pandemic, but just try to put the good into the world that, that you hope to get from it. I, I do um, want to say something to you, Jared. Um, think about your nonprofit like a single mom doing her best. You know what I mean? And I mean, that's, it sounds funny, right? But I mean that seriously, because you started your comment off with, you know, you're, it's hard to say that it's been a success because there's a, there's a lot that you haven't been able to do. But I, I feel like just from what I've seen and, you know, just knowing you these few minutes and everything that I was able to research about your organization, you guys put in the work. You know what I mean? You put in the work and you make it happen for a lot of people. And I think that's wonderful and that's beautiful. And you should feel very good about that. You know, yeah, there's failures, but we fail in small areas with everything. But, you know, I know that I've had big successes and I've had big failures, especially over this last year. And there have been many, many times where I've been doing my best and I've been kicking myself in the ass and, and telling myself, it's not enough, Frankie, you got to do more, you got to do better. You know what? You guys are doing the best you can and it's beautiful. Here's what I would love to hear. Give us your favorite impact story. If you want to keep the name of the person you helped anonymous, that's perfectly fine. But tell us about a time <clears throat> or a person or a family that you you feel like you made a, a great impact on. Sure, no, and I appreciate the perspective and I'm sorry if I'm coming across too negative. Um, oh my gosh, shut the face! You apologize <laughs> for nothing, you're a saint. <laughs> We're so proud of the work that we do and me being in my seat and being able to really see across all the programs and be mm -hmm. close to the executive team and see how hard everybody's working. I, I couldn't be more proud and like, it's just, it's it's wild. It's been a wild year. It's kind of like, I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Fresh and I'm making a dated reference here. Mm. I'm not going to explain it. It's about a young boy who lives in New York City who's really hustling and nothing phases him. He's got to be like 10 or 11. Nothing phases him. He sees like his, this is going off the rails. Anyway, at the end of the movie, he's sitting in a cab and the tear runs down his eye. And it's like, wow, like you didn't allow any of this to phase you. But right now mm -hmm. that you're in this moment by yourself, we can see it. And that's kind of what it is for us where we've just been go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. And now that like we're wrapping up and it's a little quieter this last week, it's like, this was, this was a year. Like it's been a day, it's been a week, it's been a month, it's been a year. Sure, yeah. um, so endless pride and <laughs> gratitude for the team. Um, in terms of a story, you know, I recently got a thank you letter from a senior couple who they were relying on food delivery service, their supermarket, they live in a big building. They don't want to leave the house. They were relying on a supermarket to deliver the food to them. Uh, they were attending our senior programs too, coming in, socializing, playing Mahjong, coming in for lunch once a week. And the pandemic hit. Yeah, it's cute to see. It's They get feisty, but it's cute to see. Um, <laughs> we miss it. We miss it dearly. Uh, the pandemic hit and they couldn't get their groceries delivered anymore. The supermarket stopped offering the service. They called around to every other service they couldn't get on with not to shout out big companies, but large companies that do meal service or food service. They couldn't get on with anybody. They weren't using our food pantry. They didn't realize we had a food pantry. They connected with us. We were able to get them the food pantry services. We were able to get them their meals delivered. We got them exercising where they weren't exercising before. Oh, we got it. them on, on weekly sing-along calls where we had a, a young gentleman from California who found out about the work that we were doing, who used to work on Broadway, who was like, you know what, I want to lead a senior sing along. And he cold called us. Oh, to do that's it. cool. And he, he was crushing it. So it. we got these people singing, like seeing, seeing the joy that people were taking after being in such a place of despair. Um, you know, that senior couple that really hit me reading that letter, because again, I, I don't work with the program, so I don't necessarily get to speak with the clients as much. Mm -hmm. But whenever you hear a client story, it just, it really moves you. We had another a young woman whose children were enrolled in our program. She has a teenager and an adolescent. Um, she was working two jobs. She lost both of those jobs. We connected her with our workforce programs. She got training in the home health aid field, had a job, had her child, her teenage child enrolled in our summer youth program employment position. They were both working. The young one was in our emergency child care. So to be able to take Families wow. who go from we are relying on so much underemployed, but this is the way we're making ends meet to, you know what, we're going to get you a better job, we're going to train you for a career, and we're going to do 
X, Y, Z for your family. Like just to be, we have so many stories that are like that. Dozens of stories that are like that. That's huge. That's such a, that's a beautiful, that's, I mean, we've heard lots. I love all the impact stories we hear, Stephen. Don't quote me as saying I don't. Um, (laughs) But that one is, that's huge. You literally saved a whole family. You know what I mean? And I know, you know, from personal experience, I've been in situations where, you know, I needed help, you know, from either myself or my whole family. And, and I'm in Virginia. We don't really have our, our assistance programs don't really work like how they do in New York, like at all. There's so much red tape and so much you have to go through to get to the help that you basically it becomes a full time job to get any kind of help or assistance. So you may as well take that time and focus on trying to get a job. But that's freaking beautiful. You help the mom get a job. You got training for the kids or for this, the oldest, and then you got the youngest one being taken care of so that they can go work. That's fantastic. Yeah, it is a thing where, what's the Mr. Rogers quote of like, uh, whenever there's a disaster, look at the people that, run, that are running toward to help then the, uh, the disaster itself. And it is inspiring to watch what you guys do. Um, can I ask, so the mindset that you're talking about, and it's something that I, I ask because the mindset of, of really appreciating smaller things and appreciating some simple things that I took for granted. It's something that is very new founded because of the pandemic, right? Like there, it, there's this whole joke that I have about just hearing the birds chirp for the first time, right? And was that a mindset that you had before all of this? Was it strengthened because of this? Or, or is it kind of a mindset that you uh, believe that you were kind of carrying with you before all of this hit? It's definitely strengthened. And it's one of those things that it's always easy to say out loud, but to really feel it is different. You know, like I always try to speak good feelings into existence, you know, tell myself sometimes like, okay, this day is going to end at some point, you're going to get through it. But like, again, for me personally, seeing everything that's happened over the last nine months, being able to really count my blessings and understand it a little bit better. Um, a lot of it's from the pandemic. I think with the work that we do, you know, a job is a job for everybody. Work is tough. It's grueling. It's taking you away from other things that you're doing. But when it's also so emotionally taxing, like yeah. it, it's, it's, it's tough on a good year. So I think this year being able to kind of slow down and see the impact and see that it might even be more impactful this year than before, the pandemic has definitely had, you know, an impact on the way I process and understand the importance and significance of the work that we do and look i'm a gatekeeper for the work that we do that website it's myself and our marketing assistant that you know we update that constantly our social everything that we're putting out all the email blasts so like i i know the work that we do but like the back of my hand but to really see it up close a little bit more to see and hear those testimonials to know we're serving in a different way it it changed it changed me a little bit for sure. This sure. Year. Wow. How wow. can people find you, Jared? How do they d- give you money? How do they volunteer? How do people get involved? Frankie, I'm so glad you asked that question for so many reasons. One shout out to the volunteers. The volunteers do such important work. We had people volunteering on Sunday to deliver meals to neighborhoods they had never been to. Um, so really shout out to the volunteers. www.commonpointqueens.com C-O-M-M-O-N-P-O-I-N-T queens.org commonpointqueens.org backslash donate if you feel compelled to help us continue to provide the work that we do. And you should feel compelled and if you don't feel compelled, you're a bad person. Yeah, Yeah. so one thing, I don't think that either one of you guys are in the Twitch. Uh, Jared, people are fucking loving you right now. Um, A lot of people are just, uh, you know, lots of comments of this is like one of the best community centers I've heard of and community services that I've heard of. Um, Yeah, so anybody... Uh, that's listening, that uh, feels a calling, and especially if you're in Queens, if you're in New York in general, uh, come through, donate, volunteer, all that jazz. Um, Quick and plug, I'm so sorry to cut you off. I'm so no. sorry to cut you off. If, okay. you make, if you make a donation before January 1st, all gifts are being matched by UJA Federation in New York. So yeah. if, you're try- if you want to give and you're like, I'll do it whenever, do it right now. Smash that donate button right now. And it, your gift is doubled immediately. $20 is five pounds of food. That's oh, a whole lot of meals. $20, five $20 is five pounds of food. That's right. That's, That's a lot of meals. That's if you a lot donate of meals. 20, you're going to really donate 40 because it's going to be matched. What's, what's the organization matching? UJA Federation of New York. 
UJ Federation of New York. How can we find you on the socials? Is it just at, com- how is it? What is it? For sure. On Instagram, we're at Common Point Queens. Definitely follow us over there. We've seen a lot of growth, a lot of people liking our stuff over there. We're on Twitter where we're putting out a lot of the important information that we do, mainly a lot of the work, the workforce stuff that we do, job information sessions, job training stuff, a lot of, you know, social media networking there. Uh, we're on Facebook too, our two main locations if you're on Facebook, we have the Sam, the Common Point Queens Samfield Center and Common Point Queens Central Queens, which is in Forest Hills. But give us a like on Instagram or give us a follow on Instagram and, and you'll see the rest of it over there. And uh, and tell your friends. Yeah, that, that's really it. Yeah, tell your friends. Um, that's about the time we have. Jared, it was so awesome talking to you and hearing about all the work that you're doing. Next uh, week, I heard you need somebody next week. I'm in. Let's go. Yo, we'll, we'll just keep on having you Let's back. Let's go. Um, I, I'm, yeah, we'll definitely have you on again. I think we have next week. Next week we have a, uh, somebody from third degree, third decade, uh, third decade, third decade, and so they teach financial decade, yeah. financial literacy to uh, people in underserved communities and stuff like that. So excited about that. You know what's uh, crazy about that, Stephen? Real quick, hmm. my because my you know where we live is a predominantly like upscale white area. So my in in my daughter's school they taught financial liter- literacy since like third grade. Damn, you know really? I mean? Yeah, like seriously, like really. I still have no idea how taxes work. <laughs> There's no idea. I gun to my head, if somebody were to tell me to do my taxes, I, I'd be dead. I'd be dead for sure. <laughs> and how to kill Stephen Campbell. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, you Jared, you're fantastic. Um, Your organization is unfreaking believable Like it's incredible. Again, Thank you, Jared. Yeah. Shout out to Common Point Queens. Um, <laughs> this is the Nonprofits Podcast, episode three. My name is Stephen Campbell. I have been Fanky French. Uh, shout out to Comedy Hub. One more time, Common Point Queens. Thank mm-hmm. you, guys. I appreciate you. Every every Tuesday, 6.30 30 p.m. PM Eastern, Eastern, come through. This is the most followers we, or the most that we had at a sustained amount. So just keep on coming. Keep on coming. Learn about people that are doing incredible work uh, throughout all this chaos. And yeah. Love you guys. And also Thank find you. out how much trash Stephen and I are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Comparatively, <laughs> what we like to do is, is a light and dark sort of a situation. Like, well, the light and dark is me and Frankie. And then, and then, the, and then He's the, the, dark. The, I'm definitely the light. Okay. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. 630 every Tuesday. Common Point Queens. Blah. All right. And Thank we're you. out. Thank you so much. <laughs>